As the creator of the World Championship of Guacamole, I wholeheartedly approve of this masked singer costume. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. A trip to get a mandate to get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you. Right, Gina Grant? That's right. And Bull Brian's still out, but Chris Maxipata has stepped into hey. the studio. Fresh off our show last night at the uh, Hollywood Improv with lots of great comedians. Heard and, good uh, things. Celebrities as well. Yeah, yeah so uh, great, great show you put on. It was incredible. What a lineup. Let's see. So we got Dane Cook up there, Harlan yeah. Williams, Jeff Ross, Ari Shafir, Pablo Francisco, and of course you, Adam. Yes. And uh, but like, can we talk about what the the big hubbub was yeah. when we were there? Okay. Hubbub. Hubbub. So before before we we're going to the show, we get word from the improv that a an a beyond a lister is going to be in attendance. Mm-hmm. Beyond a list. But they can't tell us who it is. Mm-hmm. And so. I'm getting ready for the show, and I see like the server meeting in the middle where the manager's running over everything that's going to happen today, and they're and I'm just keeping an ear, like see these are gonna they're gonna mention it, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely eavesdropping, and I hear Charlize Theron. Ooh, la, everybody talks la. all the way all the way. She's like Charlize Theron, Char- Theron, or Theron according to Dawson, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I thought, okay, that's an A-lister, sure. That's for sure an A-lister. And then so they're starting to see it a little bit, and I'm seeing like blonde women come in, and I'm mm. kind of just peeking. Mm. It's dark, and I'm like, that could be her, I guess. I can't Statuesque, see statuesque. Yeah, Louis. they're very pretty women sitting down, yeah. and they're like, okay, that could be her. I, um, and then uh, so I'm I'm asking around, I'm like, oh, Char- so Charlize Theron's coming in? They're like, oh no, that was last night. Oh. And I told yeah. Adam, but I told Adam like, hey, Charlize Theron's going to be oh, in the boy. audience, and you know, Adam does his hair a little bit more. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. No, I, spritz of no, I licked my hand <laughs> and then put it on top of my head like alf- alfalfa. Right. Like, yeah, yes. would do that. Yeah, hand that licking. Move. Do you ever do the Fabian, the, the wet the fingers and do the eyebrows? <clears throat> oh, uh, I'll do the brow, but it takes more than uh, Just the dip the, of the tongue. One lick. I, yeah, I need a trough for for. The unruly brow. Got it. I would say hand licking and hair smoothing has to be down 89% in this country. If it isn't alfalfa or Dennis the Menace, it hasn't been done. Yeah, well, they've been dead for a while. Correct. I'm saying, I think, really... I think this is a better country when guys yeah. lick their hands yeah. and did the thing on their yeah. head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they cared more. Then acts. Yeah, they cared. Right. There was uh, societal pressure to look <laughs> a certain way. Yeah. yeah. I said... Uh, it actually enraged a lot of people, but uh, when I explain more American males now wear bracelets than eat stew, yeah, um, or was it casserole? I can't believe it was, it was stew. stew. Not <laughs> this stew. Yeah, a lot of pussies got upset. A lot of bracelet wearing pussies got upset. That's how you know you're right. I, I, you're over the target when you take the flack. Yeah, Dawson mm-hmm. didn't get upset. Dawson wears bracelets. I've had this one bracelet since I was 18 years old, and it never leaves my wrist. But that really? motherfucker loves Stu, and that's probably to say you're diabetic or something. Yeah. But uh, but so I tell Adam, and he does the move, because, yeah, he's right. There are way too many unmowed cowlicks sure. walking around these mm-hmm. days. And uh, and then and then when I ask them about uh, Charlize Theron, the, uh, the, the servers out there, they're like, oh, no, that was last night. We were freaking about it last night. Oh. I'm like, oh, so who's tonight? It's Paul McCartney. Paul, what? Sir. Sir Paul, Paul McCartney. McCartney. Is coming in. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. What? I And I'm always like, first off, it, it, almost almost every time I show up to a comedy club that I'm performing at, I'm always in the back of my head sort of curious why people even showed up. Sure. Uh, it's always like, what are you people doing here? Because I, I was a guy who's... My own family did, didn't really tell me to shut up. They just would sit there and look at you when right. you were you know, spinning some yarn right. or doing some observational. Hey, let me tell you, uh, mom and dad, I feel like cow licks are down 89% and hand licking and cow licking. As a matter of fact, what's the between a hand? They just get up and leave. <laughs> <laughs> they just walk away. Like they didn't. They didn't care enough. They didn't to try engage or anything, yeah. and they never went like, "Oh yeah, hey, no, never thought about. Th- I never yeah. thought about it that way." Uh, later on, that just gave way to my meathead friends, mm. and my meathead friends were much more aggressive cool. about what I was doing. Yeah. You know, they would be. I'd be like, "I think licking hands and uh, smoothing over cow licks is done." Yeah, shut up. Yeah. We get it. Cow lick. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Shut up. Next. Like, yeah, they would just go. It's so funny what people, a lot of people like, when I met 
Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel would be like, oh, yeah, interesting. What else you got? Oh. My friends were like, we heard you. <laughs> Shut up. Who cares? I, I, I've run into so many people. <laughs> it's, it's a weird conversational style. Like you're going, yeah. you ever notice this? And what do you ever think about that? And they go, I don't know. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, but you could punctuate anything with who cares? Yeah, it's super fun and easy. It's yeah. always... <laughs> It's always weird, like when Jay Leno gets burnt by his car, and then you hear people talking, like, "Why are people into this? And yeah. what do you want with the car? You know what I mean? Like, why are you working on your? I, people have interests. Yeah, yeah. Conversationally, and, where are you going with this? And also, you know, what I was thinking about. I was thinking about this as I was, you know, talking endlessly to my dad about his trumpet. Um, it's assumed that I want to sit and talk about his trumpet all day, but. I can't bring up cars because he's not a car guy. Right. You know what I mean? Are you a trumpet guy? Nobody's a trumpet guy. Herb (laughs) Albert is a trumpet guy and Chuck Mangione, my dad. Everyone else is not a trumpet guy. But I thought about it. If you're into horses, you can sit and talk about horses while everyone is captivated. Mm. They are just gathering around the hem of your garment. (laughs) Tell me more. And, you know, what's the difference between a gelding and a mare? And then how old and everything. You know, Shatner comes in, he starts talking about horses. It's nonstop horse talk. You bring up cars, they just go, not a car guy. How'd you get here today? Not a horse guy. Oh. On a mule guy. Okay. I'm just saying, like, if you were master baker and you made amazing cakes and then you started talking about it i can't go not a cake guy (laughs) or you can't start talking about you know being a lawyer and working with uh people that were wrongly incarcerated Mm -hmm. not a not an incarceration guy not a justice guy but you knew so not a car guy and then we get to we get turned the page back to trumpet and horse talk (sighs) what is that so it's just a weird cop-out thing not a no, everyone's not an anything person until you learn about you it. You talk about right. it, yeah. and they have interest. I, I'm sorry, I totally agree, but this has been like six minutes. We haven't been talking about but Paul I, McCartney. I do <laughs> want to say this: I am a, I'm not your kids guy. I don't mm. give a fuck about mm. you know the six year old and the large vocabulary of the eight year old or would agree. all that shit. That yeah. that you can save. Yeah. yeah. All right, sorry, So anyway, Paul. I find out it's Paul McCartney. Oh, and by, by the a little before this, too, Dawson and I are talking to each other, and Dawson goes, A-lister, huh, I'll take the under. <laughs> when, he, when he heard somebody was coming. I get coming. it, when you hear that in Hollywood. And then yeah. I told him about Charlize, and he did the, mm, all right, maybe. B plus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then what, what did you think when I told you about Paul, Doss? He's eating. Way over the top. Way o- yeah, yeah, this isn't even an A-lister. This is before, this is a big bang This lister. is an this icon. Is before the alphabet. Yeah, so... Yes, um, so, they have. I am a car guy in the car world. They have sports cars, supercars, and now they have hypercars. Oh, does hypercar. he's a hypercar? Oh, he's yeah. a hyper. Yeah. So, I think my second reaction was no way. He's yeah, not showing up. It's almost yeah. unbelievable. So, uh, so I go back upstairs to give Adam the bad news that Charlize Theron oh, will I not be it. coming in. I, I had to it. unlick my hair. Yeah, yeah, he put it back up. Put my hair back. Hold on, don't holster those <laughs> hands yeah. yet. Right. And I told him about. Paul McCartney. It's going to be Paul McCartney. Where Adam just repeats the name. Paul McCartney. And uh, what was your thought then? My thought is always, why would he come to a <laughs> that's, show that's my thought too. that has my name on the marquee? Maybe he's a big Dan Cook guy. And probably. And then it's like, uh, you entertain me. I don't entertain you. Right. That's our relationship. You know, like with Dennis Prager, you don't want to live in a world where Paul McCartney's familiar with you. I right. know. Imagine right. telling young Adam Carolla, hey, the first time that you <laughs> see Paul McCartney, you're going to be the one that's on stage and Paul will be in the audience. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Well, if young Adam did express that to his family, they'd be like, yeah, okay. All right. All right. We can. We'd walk out they'd the room. already be in yes. the other room if they had another room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, look. So, did you, did we see him? Did yeah. we really? Also, oh, my all right. God. So, he, there's a, there's a dark booth in the corner. Of course there is. Secret entrance, like yeah, pack entrance. Sure, sure. So I'm looking. I'm look first. I'm looking for him. I can't. I can't make him. It's a dark room, and I'm looking at every single person from from like the the green room. It's an upstairs green room. So yeah. I'm looking down at the audience and just analyzing every face. Your like, opera could binoculars. That be him? Could that be him yeah. under a hat? Right. Could that be him 
like uh, and uh, with his with a big group of people. Right. Like how how would Paul McCartney come to a comedy yeah. club? Yeah. And uh, and I couldn't make him. I was like, I don't think he's here because I've looked at every single person ten times and I can't find him. And then eventually, there's an empty booth in the back, an empty corner booth. And I look up, and now there are two people sitting in that booth, and one of them is definitely Paul McCartney. Yes. Oh my god. I know. Um, no hat. Looks exactly like Paul McCartney would look if you saw him on stage. Right. Like it just that, that's just wearing all black with the, the hair. What a head of hair on oh, that man! I've seen. You think hey, that's is he eighty? I mean, he's not 75. He, yeah, he, if he's 75 plus, he's I don't, I don't know if he's 80. He's 80. He's 80. Wow. 80. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, oh so God. words getting around that Paul McCartney's in the audience. Harlan's going up. Oh, <laughs> I should have <laughs> dropped one of my dad's trumpet tapes on him. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, well, yeah. He has you know the what old I mean? slip. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just drop it by sure. the table. You're looking for session guys. Get a young I know up and you're cover. constantly creating. But yeah. go ahead. Sorry. I've I've sat in the same restaurant as Ringo Starr. That means nothing now. This is unbelievable. Same comedy Look, booth as Paul McCartney. I'm I'm still getting over the fact that I was breathing. I'm gonna say I'm breathing the same air as this yeah. guy. Like mm-hmm. I'm, in a, yeah. I'm in the room with him. So I yeah, I totally get it. Was he with uh who what kind of He was of with vibe? one other guy. You think he'd roll with a big crew, Man. just him and one other guy. Yep. It was probably Ringo Starr. I didn't. I, could, I don't, I don't know who want it to was. offend at all. That's not my purpose for asking this. But like, did we get answers? Why? Why is he there? Um, we didn't get answers. Didn't. I have. I have an idea. I think the guy just likes comedy because I. Jim Jeffries has told me a story about Paul McCartney dropping into one of his shows at the Improv. Too. Good. I like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Some people just go to the Improv to watch comedy. On I. I think it's sort of like movies. Some people leave the house twice a year and they go see a movie that yeah. they've been wanting to see. And then some people just go to the movies yeah. on Saturday night. Yeah. He's Pick probably one. that way with comedy. Yeah. But I mean, if you're Paul McCartney, you got to call ahead. <laughs> you oh, let them, yeah. yeah. You'd like to make sure security's on the up and up. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Harlan takes the stage. And- Wait, but didn't you come up first? No, no. I, okay. Yeah. Adam, Adam comes out last because he's the um, the feature, uh, oh, the, the main I, feature. I didn't know if you, were, if you were introducing the evening. No. no, no. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So... Harlan goes out there and he's just like, so uh, anybody here from overseas? <laughs> Did <laughs> he, he like, know? He's trying. To, yeah, of course. He was, <laughs> well, I didn't know if he knew. So I'm like, is Harlan doing this on purpose? <sighs> and he does a lot of incredible crowd work. He's in, he's just such a natural yeah. on stage yeah, and just very so conversational. Funny. Very funny. Um, and then and then he starts going into like a, a Beatles joke. Like he starts doing like a Hey Jew no. joke. And I'm just thinking. What is going on? So after his set, he gets off, and I go, "Hey, do you know that Paul McCartney's like, oh yeah, I knew." I <laughs> yeah, I, the overseas wasn't a tip for me, but the Hey Jude stuff and the Let It Be stuff was definitely yeah directed toward Paul McCartney. Is Paul a generous laugher? Could you pick it out? He's a generous clapper. Oh really? Absolutely. Oh, he, I did not see that. He was clapping a lot. Uh, Jeff Ross did a lot of Queen of England jokes. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Ari Ari was uh, was going up there and just didn't hold back at all, oh, and no. uh, Paul was laughing and clapping a lot. Wait, so. hold back like in general, or hold back at Paul. No, I mean um, hold back in general. Oh, like sure, it's sure, Ari sure. Shafir, right? Yeah, right, right, so, right, right. So it, it was just so yeah. I'm just watching Paul's reaction now. That's like my show. Oh, like how is Paul God. reacting to these? So um, so anyway, so Paul McCartney's in the room, and uh, Adam, you killed it too. Everybody just goes up there, does an incredible show. Well, Pablo does a lot of voices. Does he? Does he do a Beatle at some point? I think Pablo was up before Paul came in. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I was watching that. Booth. Got it. Got I was it. watching the audience like a hawk. Uh, anyway, it, it was an incredible show. Yeah. Not since when we were at Caroline's in New York when Justin Bieber was in the audience have I have I really felt the majesty of a, a mega A plus wow. hypercar wow. in our audience. Uh, so yeah, it was, was there it was, an opportunity to shake his hand? No, no, I did. When I walked off stage, I looked and I saw them get up and make a hard left and go. They were sitting in the corner booth right under the back exit. Yeah. You know what? I respect that more because, like you said, he is there to see some comedy. He'll get there when the show starts. He'll leave as it's ending. Like he's not. He's he's just there to be entertained. Yeah, he doesn't want to hang out. Long, it was over a two hour show. Wow. He wasn't there. Maybe missed the first forty minutes. I don't. I don't recall. But um, wow. But he watched. He clapped. He left. Did yeah. you? Did you have any pointed jokes? No, I I, I didn't want to. You know, if somebody goes and sits in the corner booth, they're telling you something in the dark. dark it's like yeah. one of the only dark corner booths. Then I assume they're doing it for their reasons of anonymity, and Absolutely. I wouldn't want to. 
out him. Yeah. I love that, that story. Tingles. Yeah. I, My God. I, 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 I'm still getting like we're two degrees he, from Paul McCartney. He is such an incredible person that when I was driving home, I felt like I was high, <laughs> like, like just for me in the same room as him. Yeah. So yeah, it was uh, it was incredible, and uh, congrats to Adam and and oh yeah yeah, yeah the show on an incredible show too. Good. Yes. All right. So All right. you got clips. So Anything we, else going on in your world I know, this right? week? Well, okay. So we're at the improv last night. Whereas there is a trending topic, and I'm only, I only have one for today, and it's that's the Masked Singer. And so Adam's big reveal, we talked about on yesterday's show, was that he was on The Masked Singer and he was unveiled. And uh, yeah, the internet was going nuts. I, I'm sure you saw a ton of tweets about it, Adam. Um, yeah, I didn't see the show. Yeah. I was in uh, Malibu <laughs> and I don't, know, I don't know how to do the... I don't think I have a DVR mm. in Malibu, so I can't really record. Mm-hmm. I probably could. Well, I'll, I'll help I you forgot. with that because yeah. I got a, I got a lot of mm-hmm. clips. So, yes. why, so why don't we just kick it off with um, <laughs> during the show they introduce their new singer, their new yeah. character, the Avocado. So here's the uh, first clip. Stand by. We got an audio yeah. problem. All righty. So. They're <laughs> strength keto friendly. Yeah, okay. Let's just stop. Let's pause here while they're figuring out the audio. So there's avocado. Is that your line? That's and um yeah, so there are two clues, so. two clues already. The strength is your keto friendly and your dude's dude. Oh. Dude's mm-hmm. dude. Yeah. Speaking of a dude's dude, Nick has uh something against buttons. Yeah. Oh, and Robin too. They were Robin it's like they were Thick. doing a, oh, yeah. A, a, a yeah, Robin Thick, excuse me. A yeah. peck off. Uh, yeah, who, who who can button their shirt the lowest? Wow. Yeah. Or yeah, I mean, just fasten the one at the very, right. very bottom. That's down eighty nine percent as well. The yeah. shirt's undone. Yeah, used to be when a dude was showing his goods off, he'd undo that button, and it wasn't hairless. You were oh, showing right. a, a nice, thicket. yes, a nice nest. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're seeing a lot, lot more cowlick. Yeah, and a lot more, a lot mm-hmm. more titty, ch- chest hair. Like, all right, right now we go. got it. Okay, here, here we go. go. So here's the intro. That's why Jenny McCarthy never picked you because it's the optical illusion of your the pit, the avocado pit is really where your face is. So you do yeah. look short and yeah, stumpy. The, pit, the face on the costume is at Adam's belt. Yeah. Yeah. And your head is way at the top, so it it really does make you look short and stout. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. I want the TV, the camera. You want it to add ten pounds and remove seven inches. That's exactly yeah. what all it your did. lines were gone. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, in fact, okay. So, a couple things before we get into this clue package. The the big prediction that everyone thought was the avocado when it was announced months ago was it was Tom Brady mm-hmm. because oh boy. Um, when this was filmed around the end of August, Tom Brady took an eleven day. Uh, Retirement. Uh, well, no, he just he was he just took an eleven day absence from yeah. training camp for quote personal reasons, and everyone thought, okay, he just signed a contract with Fox. Mm. He's he's mm-hmm. you know he's all about being more in the limelight right. here. Yes, yeah, he's that's him, and he loves avocados. He was actually dressed as an avocado <laughs> once for Halloween. So <laughs> so they're like, okay, that's Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we now know the truth. But uh, up until uh, two days ago, everyone thought it would be Tom Brady. Uh, so. This clue package, it starts off with you in like a high-rise apartment or condo and an eagle smashes into the window. That's yeah. clue That's number clue. one. That's... Because Dr. Drew yep. was the eagle. That's right. Oh, I, got wow. that, I got that right away. I did not even think about yeah. that. So I think if you see any other animal in these clue packages, it could be a hint. Yeah. Uh-huh. So we have that. of You're talking about air conditioning and you need a, you know, a little AC. more AC, AC, of course. Right. Yep. And then uh, they put the microphone in front of you, the headphones. The mic wasn't plugged in, Dawson. I know he's probably it's probably bugging him like crazy. Mm. Um, and then and then you it's actually comedy roast night. That's the big mm-hmm. theme. So you you give Ken Jeong a little bit of a roast, talking mm-hmm. about him being mm-hmm. on every Fox show, which he loved, by the way. He really appreciated your joke. That should be my was, roast joke if I'm that successful. <laughs> I'm on too many things. Yeah, yeah. I had some probably nastier ones, uh, I'm sure. but they chose a slightly more antiseptic yeah. one. Sure. Your Alec Baldwin jerks, jokes wouldn't work. No, yeah, mm-hmm. wrong venue. Um, all right, so let's let's move on now. So after the clue package, let's move on to some of the performance here. So yeah. this is Adam Singh, <laughs> Hit the Road Jack by Ray Charles. They, they put it on the prompter. They have a prompter. They'll put it on the prompter. The prompter's hard to read <laughs> through the screed. And uh, so... He can't rely on it, but it's there's kind of a reminder. More but like a Dumbo feather. You should just kind of commit it to memory yeah. at that 
at that point. I love the details of the costume. I just noticed for the first time the sticker on the side, like you're at the grocery store. Uh, yeah, the you know, side. they, they, yeah, I couldn't see it's any very of this, cute. this stuff. I was just in there with kind of tunnel vision and looking through the screen and trying to figure out, you know, where the mark was. But you can't, they put the mark down, they put the mark on the stage, but you can't For see who? down. So you just sort of count your steps yeah. and then stop and, uh, yeah. And whatever, and it was kind of interesting because uh, the song is in in "Don't You Come Back No More, No More, No More, because, uh, No More." Yeah, but but I I wasn't able to go. I was having trouble going up, up. So I went you down. Did. You I went down. I wrote said, that down. Yeah, you, you, you pulled it off, and the harmony sounded good in that way. Yeah, it worked. You descended, but it was still on key, so it. Worked. Yeah, well, when you have a coach. And they're and they know what they're doing, and you're going no more, no more, no more, no more. Right they break. go no, don't, don't step it down there, yeah. but try to remember to do that. Yeah. More songs. Let's listen to the rest of this. All right, well, anyway, go back. Go, five yeah, seconds. Let's get the let's get the money. Now. The what you say? Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on. I found myself sitting in the trailer, going, uh, uh, don't. Guac, uh, don't guac. Let's don't see. guac block. Don't guac block me, baby. Yeah, I was just sitting making <laughs> incredible, stupid <laughs> well, lists about avocado. I'm what an green avocado. with envy. Yeah, yeah. this yes. is the pits. This avocado is toast. Don't guac block me, baby. I want my ripe sticker back. That's good. Don't That's put good. me in a brown paper bag. I guess I'll just guac away. There you um, there's go. Plenty. And Nick Cannon did one. Like he's definitely not a has been. Oh, uh, yeah, they're, 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 well they're all done. doing them. They're all doing them. Yeah, you so. definitely to to the costumes. More to the costumes point. You're doing a little bit of walking. You're definitely belting. By the very end, you sound fucking winded. Like walking in that thing. You're like, oh, don't walk off me, baby. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you've got to be sweating your balls off. It's a lot of sweat going down because. Um, you you're you're wearing the, the outfit and um, which is sweaty enough, but you got the gloves and the sweatpants and the double boots on, mm-hmm. and uh, there's no part of your skin that's exposed to air. Right. So and don't you, forget to project. You cannot really use your legs or your arms uh. or something to to cool yourself because everything is is triple covered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, more, more, more. It's, and, and since you're doing the dissension on the uh, no more, no more, no more, no more, I, I, when you did that high note, caught, caught me off guard. You went for yeah, it. You, you really, really you really it. dug your heels in and, and just went. Yeah, just like I love uh, it. Well, the they said uh, at, at a certain point, um, you know, it's not about singing it well. It's about singing it your way. Yeah. So just, just go for it. Put your own personality into it. All right. Know? Yeah. So the uh, the judges, then they guessed. Nicole Scherzinger thought you were Harrison Ford, which is pretty cool. <laughs> After sure. hearing you sing, um, Jenny McCarthy thought you were Mark Marin, And Robin Thicke thought it was Tim Allen. Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, so anyway, so then and then there's a weird part where John Lovitz roasted you for a little bit. And you guys did a little back and forth with that. Um, yeah, why don't we hear some of John Lovitz's roast? I love taking the, you down and the not, brick wall. Yeah, <laughs> and obviously he doesn't know who you are either, so he just has oh, right. to do these broad jokes, oh, right? Yeah, nobody can know anything over there. Oh, I thought he was giving actual like yeah. hints oh, that would matter. I will tell you this though: they had a trailer next to my trailers in this uh, encampment of trailers where you could go get a massage. Nice. Yeah, I think they realized that uh, a lot of these celebrities overheating and yeah, dragging yeah. around these 50-pound suits. Not great. They got to throw a bone their way. Yes. So I did go uh, get myself a massage. Good. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, so there, there's Drew Carey does a little bit of a roast, too. and then um, But let's move on because the guest is here. So uh, that now uh, it's been revealed that the, the previous winner is being kicked off, and it's you versus a character named Snowstorm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, and uh, by the way, the bride that was kicked off was Chris Jericho. Mm. Yes. So, um, so now you guys have to do a battle royale where you both sing the same song, and then they choose a winner between both of you who moves mm-hmm. on. And and we talked about this yesterday. You're so vain. Mm-hmm. So why don't we hear a little bit of Adam singing "You're yes, So please. Vain" in the battle royale? <laughs> this is what I was worried about. 
All yeah, right. you really, yeah. you, you really went for it. I would argue that's a chick song for it a is. sing-off with a beautiful woman who I still don't know who that was. Well, did but she have a nice voice? You, you hear, yeah, yeah, we can wanted, hear some of hers too. Her. Yeah, let's listen to some of the Snowstorm singing it. No. Not a she's, singer. She can carry a tune. But she's not she's a singer. Very, she, you could tell she's she's probably pretty hot. She's yeah. <laughs> like, just I, by the, uh, that, she's, um, look at her. Right? Well, I have an look idea. The body is banging on her. I have an idea. And, uh, um, and it's not just my idea. A lot of people online are thinking it too. It's Nikki Glaser. Oh, I've heard that as well. Yeah, that now now can we hear it another like five seconds? Yeah, of let's it listen now to it. Let's that? see if that's let's see if it's Nikki Glaser. But after, don't know. After two seasons of uh, Slut Island or whatever I watched mm-hmm. with her, F Boy Island. Oh, I, you watched it? Oh, I loved it. Oh, it was okay. fantastic. Do you so wanna, you're going with Nikki Glaser? I'm, I'm with Chris. I think yeah. it is. Um, uh, How fun! I'm yeah. so glad. Do you want to see the that. reveal real quick? Oh, yeah. Let's take it off. Oh, it, it's kind okay. of funny because Nick, in this reveal, oh, by the way, everyone's guessing now. Everyone puts another <laughs> guess. They added Mark Marin and Joe Rogan to the mix. Um, so here's uh, them asking you to take it off, Adam. Mm-hmm. Like a piece Avocado of meat. We- yeah. Wait, now explain your look for the first second and a half. It almost looked like you were confused as to where you were. You look very serious. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know why. I was looking to the... Ju- I was trying to see the judges. And it was your first hit of daylight in how long? Uh, yeah, it had been a, been a while since uh, I'd seen uh, the daylight. It was uh, like the great escape when uh, <laughs> McQueen came out of the cooler. <laughs> That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah, and the judges react. You, you, they, you say some really great jokes about, oh, ever since I was a little boy in North yeah. Hollywood, I've always wanted to be on this show. And uh, and then you sing "Hit the Road Jack" again, but maskless. Oh, open, is that what open happened? To, open to the yeah. You know, I, it's an interesting thing. Um, when you have uh, adrenaline, it it you you it affects your memory greatly. Mm. We've talked about it. I think it's a built-in thing. If you got into a horrible car accident, most people just don't have a memory sure. of it. It works if hopefully if your uncle molests you, it, it it drops in. When you do stuff where there's like an adrenaline dump. First thing that goes is all the details right. and all the memories. I, it's a blur. I have no recollection. I, I, I couldn't tell you what I said. I couldn't <laughs> tell you what Lovett said. I couldn't tell you how how this came out or that came out. It's it's all kind of new. It's it's like it's like seeing it for the first time. Sure, that and makes I haven't, perfect sense. I haven't watched it yet. And I don't then know you, when I'm going to watch it. And then you, with your face shown, you do your encore. Yes, yeah, for the credits. Yeah. So yes. anyway, That's incredible great. appearance. I'm proud of you. Wow. You I did it. I guess people thought... It was fun. I think people seem a little overly impressed, but I, I, I think it's because people... I don't... I, I'm not a singer, but I think people thought I really couldn't carry a tune or something. Right. I don't know what, well, what it was. And and the, the mass singer, I find that broadcasters have such a disadvantage because everybody can f- hear your... Every, all of your listeners can tell your voice. Like We, we got tweets like, I bet Avocado is going to be Adam Krill. I just know it yeah. because... They just they hear your voice so much more than they see you. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So there's a little bit of advantage there. Yeah, but the song wasn't bad. I gotta say, I'm, no. I'm we did surprised. All right. all right. Thanks, uh, Max Pata. We can Thank get you. into this a little more tomorrow if we need to. Our guest is here, so let me hit uh, Better oh, Help. We need to. The show is sponsored by Better Help Therapy Online. There's no user manual for life. So uh, when yours isn't working, it's normal to feel stuck. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause and then learn productive coping skills. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists, convenient, secure, and accessible anywhere, 100% online. I think we've all learned from the last couple of years with all that's going on, you got to get your head right. Get your head right, and the rest will follow. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match you with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, well, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. No waiting rooms, traffic, or endless searching for the right therapist. It's BetterHelp, right, Dawson? Get unstuck with BetterHelp. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Corolla. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Corolla. I just have a really quick health update from Brian. Uh, Christy, his wife, just texted me and said he's salty today. Really annoyed and sarcastic about everything, so I think he's feeling a little better. Good. Yeah. All right. Uh, David Fenton is an author. He's an activist. He's a really interesting uh, guy who's been around everything, all the big movements. And we'll talk to him all about that right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. 
Weekly, I am forced to watch The Masked Singer with my wife. And I guess and guess because I get entangled in it. The second we heard your nasally drone, we both knew it was you. Congratulations. You walked the talk. You did something that you say to do, which was nerve-wracking. Good job, Ace. Well done. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Do stuff you're not good at on a grand stage, and <laughs> it'll, it'll uh, propel you in life. David Fenton is our guest. He has a book out called The Activist Media Handbook, Lessons from 50 Years as a Progressive Agitator, wherever you wherever you find finer books. It is out as we speak. Good to see you, David. Good to meet you. Thank you for having me. Uh, lean right into that uh, mic if you could. Sure. Lots of history for you. I, you're not that old, but I, you go back to working with um, Fidel Castro and on so many different campaigns that seem to be so far in the past, but yet you're here, you're healthy, and you look young. I'm 70, but I'm still at it. I never worked uh, with Fidel Castro. I met him a couple of times, which was fascinating. Yes, I probably shouldn't have said worked with. But you had a suggestion <laughs> for him, did you not? I did. I was uh, on a congressional delegation to Cuba uh, doing press work for the delegation, and he asked to see me. And he wanted to talk about Cuba's image in the United States, which, of course, uh, there was nothing he could possibly do about that. <laughs> but I told him that, uh, the green army uniform that he wore, uh, when he went abroad, that signified that he was a brutal military dictator. Did he really want people to think that? In, in Cuba, you know, Fidel's a complicated figure in history. He's a brutal dictator, of course, but he also brought literacy and health care and a better standard of living to his people. So I said, well, when you travel abroad, I wouldn't wear that because it says brutal military dictator. So he pause for a minute and he looked at me and his aides were very nervous because like nobody talks back to the jefe right and he said uh, next you're going to tell me to dye my beard black <laughs> and I said no 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 the beard's okay but the green army fatigues really have to go he never wore them on a foreign trip again wow. so, like, my little influence on history <laughs> well it is I, it is very interesting and, and as you think about it um, movements having a publicist or how they're how they're digested you know what i mean like like and i don't know if it's more and more now it's like whatever the bill out of florida 10 minutes ago got turned into don't say gay uh, immediately it's not in the bill but it's a great branding if you're against the bill and then everyone just picks it up and it just sort of it is. is. It, yeah. it just. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's just in the the zeitgeist. It's, and and I'm, I'm guessing. And, and Trump was kind of a master at that. You know, yeah, lying Hillary he and sh little Mark Rubio or whatever. Like he just stop the steal, make America great right. again. He, right. He, he. Are we now living in this era where everything is just going to get a bumper sticker, sloganized, and sloganized? I'm afraid so. And. You know, social media makes that worse because attention spans are shorter. And these mems, these headline type things are the way people communicate today. And it's not all good because it can be demagogued and it can be used to mislead people. But it can also be used to simplify things truthfully for, so, for people. It kind of depends on whose hands it is. Well, and also whose ears it is, right. because if you're for this thing, then it's a good thing. And if you're against it, it's not. And then the one side says the other's doing it. And the other side says the other side is doing it. And the reality is both sides, I guess, are doing it. It just kind of depends on if you like the message or not. But it is, it is an interesting era we're in, which is like I thought the computer – and cameras and things and recordings were going to clear a bunch of stuff up. And we were talking just for instance about like the Paul Pelosi situation, mm -hmm. wild confusion, speculation, mm -hmm. bizarre narratives. He said, she said, and there's cameras, there's recordings, there's nine one one, there's, there's body cameras. I, it's, it's insane that in a, you know, I understand natives by the campfire. <laughs> this ain't that we're in the digital era and we're still all wildly confused about what what happened in many result many events. Well, uh, you know, truth is a casualty, and uh, it's sad. 
I, you know, there are many reasons for it. Um, I think that uh, one of the reasons is that, you know, in, there are different eras in American history. The yellow journalism era of William Randolph Hearst was, you know, a lot of intentional distortion uh, to sell papers. And we got into a somewhat better era in the post-war period. It wasn't perfect by any means, but, you know, Walter Cronkite had a commitment on CBS to trying to be truthful. And he had a lot of influence. Like when he turned against the Vietnam War, that had a big impact. And people trusted him. And now we're in an era where there's almost no trust in the media. And it's very, very sad. And I think that it's really not healthy for democracy to have that. You know, you know, a pollster I know used to tell me that, you know, he used to find that Americans had different opinions about the same set of facts. And now everybody has their own facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that it's very hard to have a democracy if you don't have an educated population that can rely on some forms of truth and then make up their own minds about it. Well, you know, I'm wondering if we're in this era where people have people they follow to go to for cooking. There's like some people like this chef and some people like that chef and they go online and they go, I follow this person because the results are good or I trust them or they seem to be competent, you know? And then there's like a sports version of that. They're guys who prognosticate on betting and here's your picks and here's your parlays, you know, and people kind of go there. And then we all would gather around and watch the news. But I'm wondering if we're now going to just, if we're in an era where you go, like Alex Berenson. I got onto him a few years ago because he was talking about pot being dangerous for kids and he was getting flack. Just tons and tons of shit from the mainstream and all the people in the media because he was going, I study this. My wife's a pediatric surgeon or something like that. She's seen the effects and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking my mind. And I was like, that guy's pretty ballsy. And I sort of agree with them. I, I, there's no way smoking the high octane pot at 15 is going to help anybody these days or their brain development, whatever. Uh, from a non political standpoint, I was just uh, from a physiological standpoint. So I was like, that guy. And then when he came out and started talking about COVID, I was like, oh, he's taking a bunch of shit too. But I think he's over the target. And I'm going to listen to a lot of the things he has to say. That's just on COVID. You might go somewhere else for any other number of subjects, but are we kind of getting that place where, like, you have the chef you follow? You have to pick your guy. Now you're going to find tribal. America's yeah. in a tribal situation, and you know that's a tendency of human beings, as we know. But unfortunately, I would say it has been intentionally exacerbated now by several forces. So one of them is that the social media algorithms to keep people's eyeballs on their platforms purposely boost the most sensational reptilian, you know, controversial stuff to keep people coming back. Right. And, you know, that's really pernicious. Now, you know, one of the reasons that happens is that the tech platforms have zero liability for anything that is on their platforms. And personally, I think people should be able to post anything they want except maybe for crazy hate speech. The problem with the tech platforms is not that people can post what they want. That's freedom of speech. The problem comes when their algorithms pick the false baloney to put out to tens of millions of people so they can make more money from advertising. And in my opinion, and a lot of people's, they should have the same liability for that that everybody else in business has, and they have none. So let's give them an incentive to get rid of some of the nonsense. That's, I'm sorry, I, the, the name that pops into my head when you say that is like, think of Alex Jones, who's now on the hook for literally over a billion, vastly over a billion dollars. And, you know, it makes sense. But when you're saying that a tech company will find the most sensational stuff, the most bombastic stuff, and push it through, 
where's their charge for a billion dollars? They should have liability. And then if they even if they just had it, they would hire more people to look for falsehood, et cetera. Now, one of the places I'm most concerned about this is a place where America needs to have a shared understanding and a shared experience, which is the subject I now work on most of the time, which is global warming, global heating, climate change. You know, we, it, it's a terrible amazing threat to our civilization and our economy. And we need to come together about what to do about it. And if we don't have the same factual understanding of it, how are we going to come together? And there are, it's not a surprise, vested interests in this fight that put out intentional propaganda. I'll give you an example. So we're at the point where all the climate scientists agree humans are heating the earth. We can disagree about how bad it will be, how fast it will happen, but they all agree we're doing this with pollution. Now, the fossil fuel companies for decades told the public that the scientists didn't agree, and they did that on purpose because they knew that if they spread doubt and confusion about this, the that it would delay regulations on their pollution. And they learned this from the tobacco fights. Yeah, the tobacco say, companies. Same with tobacco. That's right. They used to put out this nonsense doctors don't <laughs> agree cigarettes cause cancer. They knew it was a lie. They knew doctors did agree. And they slowed FDA regulation of tobacco by decades with that. So, you know, I am particularly concerned about intentional falsehood being spread on this issue. Like, you know, the YouTube algorithms. If they get a whiff you're a conservative, they're going to feed you all this false science about climate change and try to deny it. So that's a real problem, in my opinion. And I'm working with a number of Republicans on this issue because there are Republicans, of course, who understand that this threatens the economy. What do we do with developing nations? What do we do with China? What do we do with India? Well, first of all, American leadership is still a real thing, and we should utilize it and, and create an example for other people. But the other thing that we can do is we can create penalties for imports from countries that don't attack their pollution. So there's a lot we can do. And to take the attitude that because other countries are a problem, we shouldn't do anything is kind of a suicidal path. It's not smart. This is going to affect us. You know, when all the insurance markets collapse, as they're starting to in parts of California, you can't get fire insurance. Mm. This is only going to get worse. You know, take Florida. So I'm going to say something that, you know, you may disagree with. But from what I understand from the climate scientists, Miami can no longer be saved from sea level rise because Miami is built on porous rock, limestone. And so as the seas rise, it will flood from below. No seawall can save Miami. And the seas are rising because when you heat anything, it expands. Mm -hmm. So it expands the sea. And as you melt the land-based glacier, the water raises sea levels. So we... It's too late to save Miami, but people there don't know that. And so the country's not— Well, what kind of timeline do you think we're talking well, about? you know, the best estimates are that southern Florida will have unimaginable frequent flooding starting— I mean, it's happening now, but right. it'll get really impossible in about 20 years. Well, I'll t let me push back a little bit. Please. I Part figured of the you might. problem with it. <laughs> well, you know, my, my feeling with, with global warming or or whatever whatever the subject is, I'm all for it. I'm all for prevention. You know what I mean? And and then the question is sort of how do we go about right, it? So right. if you talk to guys like Bjorn Longboard, right. they will say, I agree, this is happening, but here's a better way to approach this problem. My problem and part of the problem with the messaging is I'm old enough to remember this shit in the 70s. I remember tons of doom and gloom. There was an ice age that was coming. There was time stamps put on stuff. By the year 2000, you know, we're not going to have any. And so, so many people made so many proclamations, including Al Gore, that didn't manifest themselves, that it falls on deaf ears for a lot of people because they go, we've been hearing this doom and gloom proclamation for 60 years now. Look, I can understand that. At the same time, a lot of the predictions have come true. We're having more wildfires. We're having more smoke problems. The seas are rising. The hurricanes are getting stronger, not more frequent, but stronger. So, 
you know, this is physical reality. I, I agree, but like as it pertains to forest fires or fires here in California, which which are bad. Uh, Bjorn Lomborg would say you need to manage the forest. But he's right about that. Right. But so that both things mean, can be true. Well, of course. You know, he's. I, there's an interesting Twitter uh, account that follows him uh, and that uh, provides scientific rebuttal to some of what he posts. I would mm-hmm. say he's not the most reliable person to follow. Um, but it's certainly true that we have to take a lot of this excess uh, wood out of the forest that didn't used to be there. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's a complicated story, but thinning the forest is important to do. But if we thin the forest, but we keep making it hotter and drier, we're going to have more fires. So we should stop making it hotter and drier. I, I agree. But then the question is, is how do you balance that with an economy or with a nation that's growing not our own per se, but uh, yeah, India, China, places... Africa, places well, like that. You know, we're at the point where transforming the energy and transportation system is going to be good for the economy because clean energy is now cheaper. It's the cheapest form, and it's going to keep getting cheaper, kind of like the way computers, DVD players, cell phones, the more that are produced, the cheaper it gets. It's the same thing. And not acting will be really bad for the economy because you'll be building seawalls and you know, subsidizing insurance losses. So the, the moment is here. Electric cars are cheaper to run and they'll soon be cheaper to buy. I have a house that is 100% solar powered. My electric bill is zero. And uh, that's kind of nice, don't you think? Ed Bagley Jr. over here. No, I'm, I'm, listen, <laughs> I, I wanted to build an envelope house uh, some years ago. I wanted the triple glazed windows. I wanted even little things. Just the door, of, the doorknob, the kind handle. Of, kind of interesting, yeah. That's if the, you, what always sticks out in my mind. You build a full envelope house, and the front door doesn't have the piece of rod going to the outside knob because if you, it even happens in the house I live in now, the back there's a back sliding door. It faces the the west. The sun is on it from about one thirty in the afternoon. You will burn your hand on the inside of it because the radiant heat it's is transferring. is transferring. Right. And I love efficiency. Right. I, and I would, and I, I've toured Ed Bagley Jr.'s home, uh-huh. and I, I did a whole piece on his home. I love all that stuff, and I would love to start implementing all that stuff because that's free energy, right? As, essentially, every I light drive bulb my and, car with solar power that is free. I never right. go to a gas station. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would, I would. You charge it at your house. I do, and you get all your power from the sun. A hundred percent on an annual basis. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I would love to do that. And I would love. Well, you should. Uh, well, <laughs> um, I mean, we can help you, Adam. <laughs> yeah, but what about so? So the problem with California is they constantly talk about this stuff, but they don't have a, a grid or an infrastructure to support it. Oftentimes, and then there's been a lot of California. I went through the same shit, Bill Maher. Yeah, went that was crazy. I said to them. 20 years ago, I bought a house, and I said, I want solar panels all over the roof of this house. And they said, well, this is L.A., and you need an emergency cutoff switch outside of your front gate. And they said, everywhere else, they'll put it on the panel. They'll put it on the electric panel. But this is L.A., and we have extra rules for everything. And I said, so what? And they said, well, your electric panel's over there. You would have to trench 200 feet, two feet deep. And I said, fuck it, because they made it too hard. I understand. Look, bureaucracy is bad. You know, conservatives aren't wrong to oppose bureaucracy in government. Bureaucracy is bad. There's bureaucracy in nonprofits that drives me out of my mind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these rules need to be standardized. And they do a lot of like, we're offering rebates to homeowners or whatever. You go follow up on it. Like, yeah, we don't do that program. Yeah, that <laughs> I know, I got huge rebates. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. I, I have to help you. You got to help me. <laughs> you got to help me. Because I, I, you know, here's the way I, I, I think of most human beings. I, I don't think of people as good or bad. I think of them as weak and lazy. And, you know, you, you take, you take, uh, garbage, for an, for an instance. Mm. You know, you go out and you'll see there's trash cans on the corner, although for some reason, L.A. has an issue with garbage. I, we don't have trash cans. We just sort of garbage everywhere. But you take your average person 
and they go to a trash can in like New York City, and it's oftentimes overpiled oh, sure. with garbage. They will balance mm-hmm. that cup on top of the pile as if it's not going to fall off <laughs> onto the ground <laughs> immediately <laughs> when Reverse the garbage Jenga. guy pulls around. And the thing that's weird is most people, if there is no trash can, they'll like set it on the edge mm. of a of, of a window, a pedestal or something. That's like they won't just throw it on the ground. They kind of want to do it, but that same person's not going to walk 100 yards and find a trash can. Yeah. They'll go, oh, I wish there was a trash can here, or there's one that's overfilled. I'm not going to walk this back to my apartment. I'll just balance it on top of this pile. So we have a, like an instinct of like, we kind of will do the right thing, but we're also a little bit lazy. That's right. So you make electric cars cheap enough. You give us incentives to retrofit our homes with solar panels, and most people will just do it, not even because they're environmentalists. Incentives are important. You know, we don't live in a utopia yet. And so, and you know, and this is one thing I appreciate about conservatives, that they recognize that human nature is, you know, good and bad. And you, you want systems and incentives that bring out the good and protect the whole. That's why we have divided government. That's why we have checks and balances. I sometimes wonder why those conservatives that are so correctly concerned about excessive governmental power don't worry about excessive private sector power and monopoly power. That's a problem, too. Well, they think that private sector power has a way of working itself out, whereas the government just grows and grows and grows, you know. Well, one of the ways monopoly well, power not, works itself out. There's a thousand out, examples of where it does Is that they I'm just rip is, you off. So, you know. I mean, look what's happening with gas prices in California right now. Uh, you know, the the oil companies are making much greater profits than they ever. How did. do you know how much gas is? <laughs> because I drive by all these gas stations. Drives right <laughs> by them. <laughs> and sometimes I have to rent a car. You right, know? <laughs> but they would say that's California is making it too difficult. And that's to a lie. Make us gas. The, the the data is clear. The oil companies just published their profit figures, and a number of them, two years ago, were making twenty cents a gallon profit, and now they're making a dollar a gallon profit. Oh, you know, as the wholesale price of oil goes up, they don't reduce their profit margin. So the more the price of oil goes up, the more they make. So I think that that's an well, example of monopoly okay. power that is not good for our civilization. All right, but then we have a lot of taxes on fuel in California as well, which is an example of government. But it's overreach. not the bulk. The, the notion that that's the bulk of the high prices here is a myth. Why don't oil companies do this in every state? Why they limit it to California? Well, because apparently here they can get away with it. <laughs> and who's letting them get away with it? Well, you know, you know, we have very imperfect human systems. I mean, we're deep blue in California. Yeah, well, Why the, are governor, we letting these the governor has just con- is convening a special session of the legislature to try to pass an excess windfall profits taxes on the oil companies and return some of that money to consumers. And I think that's a good idea. And, you know, other countries have done this. Look, you know, but California is really the only state where you know, these guys are big. And no, they're, they're making and they're too they're much making money, money everywhere. Yeah, but, but it's worse California here. twice what, um, I don't know, Utah is? It's not twice. It's about 30% more. Or I'll find somewhere in the Midwest that I've traveled to. I mean, it's close Missouri, to twice. Were, yeah. Missouri. Yeah. It, it's not state taxes. It's not the reason. Well, it's not regulation. It's not state taxes. It's that they can. Well, we have refining. We refine fuel here much differently than they do in the rest of the country. So some of it is that. And a bunch of these refineries are shut down, and no one can figure out why they're all so shut down. But that keeps the price up, too. There's there's price fixing and manipulation going on, and that's what happens with monopolies. I would go along with you on your premise, and I will to some degree. I'm saying it's very bizarre that California is the state they're choosing and not – it seems like they would do it – nationwide. Well, there's a lot I'm of saying. drivers here. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, it's well, a big state. Well, and I think the point being that we're allowing it and others aren't. Yeah. Our government is allowing it, other governments aren't. Abroad, they don't allow it. It's true. But listen, look. I here's here's my here's what where we can agree on. Uh-huh. Business is there to exploit. They want to make money as much money 
as they can wherever they can True. that's that's who they are and i don't look at them as good or bad i i don't look at a grizzly bear chasing down a camper <laughs> as bad that's what grizzly bears do true you, you know what i mean i i i i don't wish it upon the camper but it's i don't hate the bear that's they do what they do and we can go that that's evil or that's predatory or whatever but that's what businesses do they try to make money there's something about California that is letting them do what they do. And we're blaming them, but they're going to do what they're going to do wherever we let them do it. My question is, is what is going on with California where they've seen some sort of opening and are able to seize it? Well, I think it's if the governor succeeds with getting this excess profits tax passed, this, this thing is going to get better, I think. But look... You know, my prediction is they will just pass that along to the consumer. I think he he's planning to rebate it. Let's see if he does. All right. I Let's don't. I, I, I hate Gavin Newsom. I, I understand. Think there's something wrong with him. But so as you know, not everybody is do anything. Not everybody is all good, and not everybody is all bad. No, Gavin Newsom's all stupid. Which is <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Sorry, he's a sociopath. There's uh, okay. something wrong with it. Okay. I've interviewed him. Uh-huh. There's something really? mechanically wrong with the way his brain functions. <laughs> Something wrong with him. I don't know that he's stupid or he's bad or he's smart. It's just something wrong so with him. So back to the grizzly bear. Yes. Because I agree with you. So this is why I find the usual debate that, you know, should we have free markets or regulation? I find that a very dumb debate. Mm-hmm. Because the question isn't one or the other. It isn't either or. It's what's the right balance between yes. those things. Yeah. Because you have to have rules or you'll have thievery, the grizzly bear. And yeah. if you have too many rules, you'll slow down innovation and you'll slow down prosperity. Yes. So, you know, this in the Soviet Union, they had excessive rules and they strangled themselves. But if you have no rules and no umpires and nobody – setting the terms of what people can do, you're going to have people be ripped off. So what's the right balance at different points in time? That's yeah. the way we should talk about well, it. Well, it's sort of like you go automobiles. You know, you go, well, what if there were no safety rules in automobiles? And then somebody who was a free market person would say, well, Volvo or somebody would step up and, and start innovating and then they would advertise that way and they would try to get people into their cars because of safety and i go "Eh, yes that's true and then you go well what's the government's role and you go well you know oh you know harnesses over your shoulder and crumple zones and like airbags and you go okay mandate that stuff and that's going to create a safer safer vehicle and the problem with government and i i agree so then there's a balance that's you go, what it's about you go now california over regulates and so they just keep going so they want to have breathalyzers for you to breathe into for the car before you start it off in the car oh yeah oh, a, i haven't heard this. oh this yeah. is well that's that's the whole thing they better not be for potter i might fail <laughs> <laughs> well that's what your diamond lane buddies are for but be careful when you tell them to bend over although i gotta tell you one of the great things i found about the tesla so-called autopilot yeah. is you know if sometimes if you need a little help it's very convenient i uh, hey I good agree. to know <laughs> So it's it, I, I agree it's it's balance and you know I don't know who's who's getting it right but I can tell you that in my opinion California is overregulated uh-huh. and that's why many businesses leave. All right, David, we're uh, plumb out of time, but let me give a plug to the book, The Activist Media Handbook, Lessons from 50 Years as a Progressive Agitator, and now working on both sides of the aisle, and you can get that uh, wherever you find finer books, and shoot him a tweet, at D. Fenton as well. Uh, Let me give a quick shout-out to my friend Jordan Harbinger. All right, so we got... uh, Byron Bowers, comedian, coming in here in a second. David, uh, come back anytime. Great, thank you. And uh, happy motoring. (laughs) We'll take a quick break. Back with comedian Byron Bowers after this. (laughs) Byron Bowers is on the Adam Carolla Show. That is a funny joke. (laughs) Thank you. Good to see you, you, Byron. How you doing? Uh, Byron's got a special (laughs) out that's not written out correctly here, I don't think. Byron Bowers, spiritual N-word, but I just have N. N asterisk, 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 Yeah, spiritual nigga. 
uh, and let you know, it's everybody asks me like how to say it. It's mostly uh, white people. The yeah. Nazis get it correctly <laughs> all the time. You know, yeah. They're so. an elocution, those people. You know, and it's a tribute with the Nazis. It's a tribute to the way that uh, I'm sorry for moving, but the comedy albums would come out, and people didn't know how to who George to talk Car- to them about. Oh, them. Uh, Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor had all, them. Well, yeah. all of them really. They would be like these things people watch in the basement, mm-hmm. right? So I wanted to the do a water cooler version of that. The uh, it's streaming on Hulu, by the way, and uh, also you do a fair bit of acting. As well, are you primarily think of yourself as a stand up and actor second, or how do you balance stand up first? Of course, uh, I've been doing stand up probably 17 years now. And, and where'd you, yeah, started in Atlanta, Georgia, and then I moved out to LA like three years in, and uh, LA ever since. Yep, is uh, what I, I've been in LA my whole life, so. I've definitely seen the decline in L.A., but it's kind of like. Decline as far as what, though? Well, I mean, just like homeless and garbage and, and like that, that kind Quality of stuff. Quality of life. Quality of life stuff. But I was a part of that, uh, that 09 sleeping in the car. Uh, oh, after group. the bubble burst? Yeah, I came to L.A. at the right time because okay. I only had like $500. <laughs> and that's the perfect time to yeah. come to a city uninvited. <laughs> <laughs> Because people was invited to L.A. and they would come in, they'd get the best hotels and stuff. And I had to, like, you know, crawl my way out of the situation I was in. So. Did, have you noticed it declining in the 17 years you've been here? Yeah, but I thought it was only because I'm in a different socioeconomic place now. Oh, I see. Right. So uh, when I moved from downtown, like, we all was in a certain place uh, when I moved to Los Feliz. Uh, Felice and the homeless made its way up there. Mm-hmm. I was like, "Uh oh, mm. I don't." I'm confused. Like, am I moving down or am or are they moving up? Well, homeless have figured out that if you're gonna not pay rent or pay taxes or pay a mortgage, why not do it in a nice part of town? Like, why hang out on Skid Row when yeah. you can do it in Venice or Malibu? I was on Laurel and Hollywood when I was sleeping in my car. Uh, yeah, and I came from Inglewood, so it was a thing. I had the same. Oh, you drive in? No, to- I, when I uh, when I was sleeping on my homeboy's floor, Ron G. Shout out to Ron G. In Inglewood, and then I had to leave. I was like, I could live anywhere in California, yeah. so I decided to move to like that nice part of where Laurel and Hollywood meets Hollywood. Yeah, the base of the hill. Yeah, the yeah, base of the hill. Right it was a nice neighborhood. Yeah. People would wake up jogging in the morning. Near the, uh, <laughs> near the Laugh Factory if yeah. you want to go work out. Go work out. Uh, the, you know, the coffee bean was right there at the time. Yeah. How long did you live in your car? Not long, probably like two or three weeks. And then I, I couch surf. I moved up. I slowly moved up <laughs> in the world. When you live in your car, even for the three weeks. I went from the floor to the car, which is four inches off the floor, <laughs> to a couch, which is like six <laughs> inches off the floor, to a bed. Oh, you, you've you embraced my theory of bed height and success. <laughs> and I think it's in one of my books, Chris. I can't remember. But I grew up with a mom who had a mattress on the floor. So she slept on the floor with the mattress on the floor, which, by the way, when you're decorating, when you're making a movie and you're decorating a crack house, the prop master will say, "Make sure there's a mattress yeah. on the on floor. No floor. daylight between the no mattress box and the, spring, yeah. no frame, no nothing." Yeah. So my theory is on the floor was bad. Uh, getting up, you know, eighteen, twenty-two inches means you got a box spring and a frame. Getting high enough where the dog needs a set of stairs, yeah. that's good. But you go too high, you're on a prison bunk. Yeah, that's now, loft and too high. You're loft and you have, yeah. no, wow. you have no room. There's a sweet, <laughs> it's a sweet <laughs> spot. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I like that. You went from the floor to the floorboards to the sofa. This is all graduating yep. in height. And anybody, I'm telling you, you've arrived if you have a little trouble getting onto your bed drunk. <laughs> That means you're a winner. I agree. But it stops. <laughs> it, it like it, it stops at like forty. It stops at like thirty-seven inches. You, you go should be able higher. to get a desk under there. That's right. Yeah, I mean, after a while, you also need storage in LA, so you need at least a shoebox height. That's right. Off the ground, you need those big, long uh, Tupperware Who, bins. 
uses any of those, you know, every time there's a piece of exercise equipment, they always go stores easily under your bed. And they show the nice looking woman folding Mm -hmm. it down and sliding. Is there a human being who's bought a treadmill that dutifully puts it under the bed after each use? You put it under the bed and there it shall live. That's where it lives, right? What I like about now we don't have nothing under the bed, which I don't like uh, because it's a lot of dust in L.A. Yeah. Um, so if you do have something, I would uh, recommend you store it under the bed just to hold the dust at least. <laughs> you go from the car to the sofa and then you sofa surf. A couch surf. They call it couch surf, but it's right there. with, with The alliteration is, is right there. Maybe it's because a sofa seems nicer than a couch. Hmm. You know, like a sofa seems like an upgrade to a couch. It's just when you're coining a phrase. Yeah. Sofa surf. This has come up before, by Much the way. better than couch surf. But, but sofa is is like, I mean, that sounds so luxurious. That's what I'm saying. Sofa surfing. Is there a difference between a couch and a sofa? Is there a difference between a vase and a vase? I think a couch is like <laughs> rough. <laughs> like it's the leather. Curtains and drapery. <laughs> Let me think about that one. Yeah, I think, yeah. I need the def. I need my bed height. <laughs> Chapter and now I need to know the difference. I have between the a bed height, but let me let me find. Do it. dudes even call it dra- drapes, drapery? None Curtains. that aren't in the interior design business. We got to put the wrappers on that. I want to hear some drapes. Oh, <laughs> drapery. I heard a drip because that's what they call clothes now. Drip. Oh really? Oh, I yeah. thought it was gear. Is the gear over? I mean, you know, if you're working out, REI is called gear. But when you go somewhere nice and it's drip, I didn't know you that. got you got mattress height. Sure. Yeah, yeah. it's from uh, not talk about material. It's one of your tangents. Wow. Uh, I, I have a theory about mattress height and its relationship to a person's level of success. When you hit the optimal distance between the top of your mattress and your floor, then life is good. Here's how it works. If your mattress is lying directly on the floor, you're a loser. If it's on a box spring that's on the floor, you've added seven inches, but you're probably still working at a car wash. If you add the five inches for a cheap metal frame, you're in better shape and probably somewhere in the middle class. Conversely, you don't want the mattress to be too high off the ground. That puts you on a makeshift loft in a bachelor apartment or a prison bunk. I became obsessed with this idea one day and went around measuring various mattresses. After exhaustive and costly research, I've determined that 30.3 inches is the target we should all strive for. That's the height of a good pillow top mattress on a nice box spring and frame. So Byron, this stuff has been thought of. <laughs> I mean, just the fact that you went around measuring uh, <laughs> uh, mattresses is like, wow. Yeah. Wow. I do my research. Uninvited. I see. I'm thinking of tires. When he said 33 inches, I'm like, man. <laughs> I know tire size as well. I got a, um, I got a question for you then. I got a 4x4, uh, four four and mm-hmm. um, I got some BFs on it, 65. Uh, 65 series? Yeah, 65 uh, series. And um, I don't know how much air to put in them. Like, it's 34 PSI in them. What kind of truck do you have? I have a Cayenne uh, built up for Ooh. overlanding, 4x4. Four four. Oh, you go off-roading? Um, I bought it and went off-road, and I plan on going off-road more. The, um, I also have the, the Carrera, but I use that just in the can- canyons. You got a Porsche? What Both, year? right? Uh, no, I got a 997, and I got a 957. Wow. What's a 957? That's the, that's the Cayenne. Uh, oh, second okay. Second generation. Um, so... We have our definition between couch and sofa. Uh, okay. It'll it'll be on the side of your tire what it wants to be in terms of PSI. But if you're doing stuff like going off roading, you want to let some air drop out. it out thirty PSI. Yeah, yeah I'm okay. not an off road expert, but you want to drop it off a little bit in the tire pressure for off road, and then uh, put a little in for the highway sofa. And couch. Do we think there's a difference? I think people think of sofa, like you said, as more luxurious. Mm-hmm. Comfy. Okay. Yeah. What do we got? All right. So couch comes from the French word couché, which is like to lie down or a piece of furniture used for lying down. It mm-hmm. doesn't have arms. Sure. Sofa is, it comes from the Arabic word sufa, which is a wooden bench covered in cushions and blankets. So that's that, So as time went on, Couches became a lot more casual where you can lie down in them, whereas sofas were always meant for sitting. So mm-hmm. you would sleep on the couch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm still confused, but okay. Yeah, so that makes sense <laughs> for couch. couch I surfing. still land on the side of alliteration yeah. and sofa surf. And by the way, 
you would never discern between a couch and a sofa if you're broke and True. needed a place to crash, Agreed. right? Could we split the difference and go the other way and call it like couch crawling? Yeah, as long as the first two letters. I mean, you are got that's when you drunk. <laughs> landing on, and you crawling over the armrest. That's true. Every everywhere you land. So That's how right. long were you doing the couch surfing? Wow, um, maybe two years or something like that. And who were the people you were surfing? Um, uh, Josh Adam Myers, uh, um, Maxine Whitfield. Um, I don't John. need their the Christian names. I just oh, mean like okay. these are like friends. <laughs> oh, or okay. Comedians. I'm going through my whole memory. Like, I want addresses. Yeah, it was. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like are these other friends, comedians yeah, and people other you com- meet, other clubs comedians and stuff? and stuff. That's how you know you're talented when the people let you in their home <laughs> in L.A. You know, um, but yeah, it was mostly other comedians and like friends that I met. And how do you broach it with them? Like, do you have a conversation? <laughs> Neil at the Brennan. Club? Shout out to Neil Brennan. Uh, sometimes you meet them. Um, like, I was, I was doing an improv class, and I needed a, a place to crash, and you would ask. And uh, another guy who couch I was uh, surfing on, who also was surfing on the couch. We was both couch sur- surfing together oh. and until the uh, eviction people came. Oh, boy. Because mm-hmm. the, the guys who place we was in, they, they fled and left. So we just stayed in the place. Smart. This is my argument. Park La Brea. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> This is my argument with the homeless people all being either insane or junkies or both. When it's not people always go poor people, people can't afford the high rents in L.A. Yeah, but if you're sober and you're decent and your reputation is intact, even if you're from another place like Atlanta, you can befriend people, have conversations and move move along. Yeah. Yeah. I think it helps if you're talented, too. Like They see what you can do. Yeah, they gotta they gotta believe in your ability yeah. a little bit. Agreed. You know what Thank happened to um, God made me uh, think of um, I'll think of the I'll think of the story, which is a an argument against uh, couch surfing, which is um, God uh, Max Kellerman. You know him? Nope. Don't He's a bill. boxing analyst. Okay, sports guy. If you saw Max Kellerman, you'd go. Oh, yeah, I I know that guy. There, there he is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do. It do look like eight people I know. I was gonna say he looks <laughs> white, dude. Do you, he's all over. He's been on like ESPN for like twenty years. I did not know it's a stock. It's like a stock photo it for white look people. Like a, it's like, I knew you were gonna say that. It's crazy. <laughs> it's it's very central casting stock photo. He's a. Uh, Hey, he was a boxing analyst. He was one of the youngest boxing analysts ever. He was he would go on David Letterman as a boxing expert at like age twelve. Oh wow. or something. Wow. Did not know that. Yeah. He was a major boxing guy. Now I think I think Max it just does all sports uh, now and I don't know if he's on ESPN. Anyway, he's a good dude. Uh his brother let a guy couch surf who was an ex uh, boxer. And then at some point, his Kellerman's brother asked the guy to uh, move, move it along after X amount of time on his sofa, and the guy killed him with a hammer. <gasps> well, you lost. So you, don't tell <gasps> that story before you're asking. That had me at, at X boxer. That means he's already out. Yeah. So that's a different thing than an up and coming boxer. Right. Oh, right. You were an up and coming comedian. Yeah, see, that was the real thing. You were an ex comedian. Yeah, I wasn't an ex comedian. That's a different thing. Yeah, you're right. Wow. Jesus. Yeah. Those are things that jump out to me. It's like, <laughs> you know, that's a dirt. Yeah. I just think of the bell curve. You're on the other side. That's of the, exactly of the right. The bell curve. So you think a lot of people believed in your talent. And if they didn't, they might not have been as gracious. Agreed. Mm-hmm. But did they voice it? Did they go like, you're really funny. I believe in you. Like, I come stay. Or was it just a vibe that this this guy's got it? You know, I think it reminded me of a time because uh, it's a guy named Gerard Carmichael. Mm-hmm. It's a guy named Real sure. Battle. All these guys are executives now. Listen, know. I know black people. Evidently, you don't know white people. <laughs> but I know black people. I, I'm from Atlanta, so... You know who Max Kellerman is? Oh, uh, look, man. All right. It's a lot I don't know. I just found out who some... some... Uh, show, show me a picture of Gerard Carmichael. Gerard. Gerard. Sorry, screwed up. <laughs> Gerard 
Carmichael, and they'll go, oh, yeah, that guy's a funny comedian. Yeah. Or he might be like, that's a stock That's photo. just a that's stock right. black person. <laughs> that's every police line of <laughs> black right. person right there. <laughs> I can see it, people. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but yeah, there's a few of us you. that that was on the couch at the same time, and we was like, "That's our theory." Like, yeah, because we we had talent, mm-hmm. and all of us are like in a crazy better place now. Well, now, the question is, will we let somebody sleep on our couch? I was going to ask you that. Mm. It depends on the talent level. You know the <laughs> sacrifice that we that we made and took to get here. So if they have that drive and dedication, yeah, yeah. And if you're in Los Feliz, you're probably in a sweet house. I agree. Oh. I agree. Yeah, I didn't even mean to say I agree. I just naturally agree. That's right. If you have two Porsches and a four by, they old though. Don't they? Not the good ones. Did anybody you, say that yeah. about Porsches? They not. The, they not the good ones. Well, what you want with a Porsche <laughs> is you want a new one or an old one, but the in between ones are the ones you don't want because you can get a vintage one and that's worth hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I don't. I have the in between ones. Right. You know. Nah, yeah. nah, the civilian motorist. Do uh, where do you get them? Uh I guess Craig anywhere Craigslist or you know anywhere you can find cars that <laughs> for a certain price. I flew I flew to get both of mine. I flew to Marine County and drove it down the car in the truck because uh, it's off road. I got it in Utah in Richmond County um, by a guy named uh, Judd who do adrenaline industry. He builds Unimog trucks and all these big trucks. So. You know what a Unimog truck is? Mm-mm. Those are it's the like a weird European military, but also like the Department of Parks and Roads and everything would use it. It's like this modular vehicle that could put an Mm-mm. auger bit on it and could put a, a rake on it and could put a backhoe on oh, it. Shit. Like it's yeah. a it's it's a weird. It's, it, it has a Mad Max vibe. Yeah, but, you know, it was the times of uh, 2020, and everybody was going outdoors. So That's he, right. He put a camper on the back of, like, a full uh, studio apartment. Oh, my God. So where do you uh, where do you go off-roading? Well, I haven't been. At, I, only in Utah. When I bought it, oh. I went off-road, and I mm-hmm. parked it and went to Baltimore to finish shooting a TV show. Mm. And I came back. I just landed back in L.A., and the show was, I mean, the car was in a car show already called Unstop uh, mm-hmm. for PCA. So I'm like, oh, I'm putting this thing to work. <laughs> Did uh, you grow up in Atlanta? Yeah, I grew up in Atlanta. Born in Athens, Georgia. Raised in Atlanta, Georgia. And, and really uh, didn't have a car growing up. My, every car my mom had didn't work. So I never would get, I was like, I would never get a car I couldn't work on. Hence me driving older, older cars. I'm not sure how old you are, but with the Athens, Georgia connection, were you a, a big REM fan? Uh, that's no, all I can think of. But <laughs> I found out about them about them later in B-52s. Yeah, that's right. I know Love Shack when it was on because that's all they played. <laughs> Do uh, I'm reading here your father once abandoned you in a crack house? Uh, yeah, the first the day I found out he smoked crack, um, I was in the, I was in the projects uh, shooting basketball. He I guess he left to go find some money or something. Mm-hmm. And he left me there, and that's when I realized I gotta I gotta do something. How old are you? Um, like fifteen. Mm. A, a, a crucial age for a young young person. Where was your mom? My mom, um, I don't know. I was visiting my dad in Athens, and my mom was in Atlanta somewhere working. And so for you, growing up, was comedy the plan? Was acting the plan? Or was it just get a job? I don't know. I followed my instincts. But I wasn't going to get a job. I was the first to graduate from college. I went to engineering school. And I was just hanging out, basically. And then people was like, you should do stand-up. But the first... Funny movie I remember seeing it was uh, Eddie Murphy was an actor I didn't know he did stand up mm. so um, I think it had something to do with that and then Def Jam influenced me a lot in high school. What was your engineering degree in? Electrical engineering and uh, business management. So how did you get into that from where you grew up? Uh, just uh, I remember taking apart like my mom would buy stuff off the street like TVs and shit like that, and I would take them apart. And um, I was interested in how things were made and, and being creative. The first dollar I ever made was on art. Like I sold a drawing in like the fifth grade of, uh, um, what's the skateboarder that was famous? Tony Hawk? Tony Hawk. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> I just bumped into Tony. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was, so I- Show I, a picture of me. It looks like a rando white guy <laughs> to me. You know what? 
Yeah, but he's like tall and slim, super but he's slim. Still, yeah. He still does fit the composite of basic white. Yeah, thing. you don't know. I, I didn't know that was actually Tony Hawk, Tony Hawk, like the superstar when I when I ran into him. But I was on mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so technically, it's not his fault. Yeah, it wasn't his fault. Um, but I think just the loitering around and bouncing around throughout my life helped me transition because I know I didn't want to work a job, job. But you're always mechanical and interested in taking stuff apart and how stuff worked, yeah. right? Which I try to explain to people all the time. It's just a thing. Some people are that way. For many people, it doesn't make sense to them. We always try to ascribe it to something. Like, you bet your dad was a rancher, and that's where you learn. And it's like, no, most guys that are into taking stuff apart and figuring out how stuff works are just mechanical. Well, my dad was... God damn it. Look, wait. My dad was in the Navy and he was in electronics also. But I didn't know. I never seen him do it. But if you show him a resistor, he could tell you to color code and break <laughs> everything down. And that, I know that was the schizophrenia or the. Oh, he had schizophrenia. Yeah. That usually sets in when you're like 19 or something. Yeah, Early that's 20s. the crazy part. Does his set in later? Well, I, I thought it did. I thought the drugs caused his schizophrenia, but then I found out that they said he never came back home from the Navy the same. Mm. Hmm. And so that leaves, you know, things that I was taught up in the air. Are your parents around? My mom's around. My dad passed in 2019. Mm. How old was he? In my arms, 64. Mm. And you shot that special in 2019, right? Uh, I sold it in 2019, and I shot it uh, last year. Oh, right. But the good news is I was able to be there at his his bed, Mm -hmm. and, and like, he passed in my arms, and we, we, you know, got a lot of things were handled on the, at, at, uh, before he crossed it. It was cathartic. You spoke about a lot of things. Yeah, but he couldn't respond. But I, I think he got it. I thought he got it. You I, could see it. I could see it in his eyes, but then I had a bad mushroom trip, and I died as him, and I saw me, and I was like, what if he thought I was deaf? Because I was wearing an all-black was hoodie. Was this different than the Tony Hawk mushroom trip? <laughs> Yo, that, that, was, that was different. This was a, a hero dose. <laughs> And Tony Hawk was just like, I'm finna go to the Oscar, uh, the was it the Oscars? Yeah, and I just want to be present. Oh, so that was like a micro dose. Yeah, micro dose. What is a micro? That way, I went walking to Oscar like, look at these fake motherfuckers and hear these Hollywood people, you know? Right. So if you do, like, uh, let me, uh, I'll give you an example. Okay. Let's say, let's do a booze example. I'm a lightweight with booze, even though I have some now. I'm sipping it. I don't drink coffee. Shout out to Blanco Tequila and people who created it. <laughs> it's a God bless them. God for, bless them. For a guy who doesn't do much booze, it's 2.30 in the afternoon. That's great. All right, but hold on. Let me give you an example. Okay, and tell me if there's a mushroom, if this makes sense with mushrooms and microdose. Okay. Right? When you, uh, you would do a, you know, a late night show, oftentimes there would be a bar. Sure. Uh, you do Bill Maher's show, and they'll they'll have some booze bottles mm-hmm. in little mini bottles of wine and mm-hmm. booze and stuff. It's in your dressing room. They put it on the table, right. like next to the jerky. You don't have to right. look around for it. You have to ask. And uh, it would be that way with Leno and The Tonight Show, and I'm sure before that, Carson. And they, they got the booze cart in the yeah. hall between the two dressing Loosen rooms of the people on there. Right. Yeah. So what they're saying is, is some people are a little better with just a shot, you know, just to just – to, knock the knock the dust off and you'll go out there and you won't be overcome by the moment right. and the lights and all that kind of stuff yeah. too much you're going to get sloppy yeah. <laughs> out there and it's going to be a shit show so is the sort of micro dosing with the mushrooms a little bit like that i agree it is it is because if you take too much and you're in a room filled with electricity you're going to feel that energy and yes. it can be a negative thing because it's not in tune with nature but when you microdose, how do you know how much to take? Um, you just go that that is based on like your like alcohol is based on your own tolerance level. So I recommend yeah. take a little bit, wait thirty minutes, then take a little bit more. Yeah, but do not cheat that thirty minutes because that yeah. mistake is bad. We're like it's been twenty minutes. And if you, don't you feel haven't anything. eaten, it's gonna kick in faster. That's right. So the microdosing will just kind of tune you in. Like when you're going things. to an event. Yeah, like you can't, it's hard to be angry mm-hmm. on, on, on shrooms unless you have a hero dose. You're going through a bad trip, mm. which a bad trip ain't really bad because there's lessons to be learned in bad trips. So, um, but yeah, it'll make you present. It'll make you focus. 
But it's sometimes hard to think on it, too. Because mm-hmm. you can't go back in your mind. So, like, when you go up on stage. Ooh, that was hard. I did it one time. I was coming off an a acid trip, and I, I landed at this, what I thought was a show, but it was, uh, like, one of those uh, hell gigs at, like, this homeless shelter. And <laughs> the table, the, the wood grain on the table was moving like witch's potion. <laughs> and I performed in front of a table, like this big round table, and I'm looking at it move, and I would look up, and it's like these old, older, like black dudes standing there mad because they wanted to watch the game. Yeah, not super ready to laugh. No, nah, and I'm like, I told you, I was like, I don't know if, uh, if I'm looking at my future or y'all looking at y'all past <laughs> right now. <laughs> and, but I could not think of a joke, joke, because you're in such an honest place uh-huh. that. Trying to do a setup punchline just won't work. But can you microdose and go out? Oh, uh, that was a version of microdose. I was coming down. Oh, like I, re- were... I drove from the canyons, right? From Topanga Canyon, so I'm I'm definitely in a chill place. <laughs> but it's not like your thing to microdose and go on stage. You're oh, not no, known for that. Wouldn't. No, hell no. But yeah. going not to yet. the Oscars, it would be. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Like it was, I was there with my lady. You know, um, it was an event. You know. Um, the only crazy part is when the slap happened, I felt it in my knees. Oh, because you were rolling. <laughs> Where were you when the slap happened? How close I was in the you? back. It, I was far away from it. And uh, the Williams sisters were right here. And it was a group who won an award for uh, silent. It's not a silent film, but they don't speak. Oh, oh the Def. Coda. Coda. Coda, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. If I mm-hmm. offended y'all, uh, y'all no, ain't no, no, listening no, no, to this no, anyway. No. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. I'm just making sure. I get confused sometimes. <laughs> but um yeah, I was like right behind them and when the when the slap happened, they was it was like Oh, they're they talking like to each other. Yeah, and we didn't know we didn't know whether it was real or not. And then they went to commercial break and we went online and it already went viral. Yeah. Wow. For like in three minutes. minutes. Yeah. And you were high? I was like in a good You're in a good place. Good place, focused. Like I wasn't considering myself high, but I could not not you know, I felt bad, but at the same time, I was balanced. I was like, man, it's, I'm glad I came to this. Because I never watched the Oscars before. So yeah. this is my first Oscars watching, too. But it did. I did feel like the first time I went to a nightclub and a, um, a shootout happened. And I was like, it'll never be the same when wow. I go, go back. The first time you went to a nightclub? Yeah, the first time the shootout happened. Because you go to somewhere and have a good time, and then, like, fight happened and gunshots were up. So the next time you go, it'll never be like... You, your naivete is gone. Yeah, a little, yeah, a little mm-hmm. PTSD. Right? Yeah, so the next time I go to the Oscars oh. saying I'm going to come back, um, <laughs> that I'm like expecting some shit can go down. During the break, because I think you're the only one we know who was there, um, did Chris Rock stay on stage? I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, Denzel took him aside. It took Will aside. Do you remember or was it just a blur? Uh, like during that commercial break, it was all shocking. I remember looking at the phone and Getty mm-hmm. Images had an image, a uh, picture of a close, beautiful photo, <laughs> and I was like, "How the fuck they get this so fast?" <laughs> so I was like, "Coming, I was just in. I was like, man, I can't believe that they did. They 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 already took something so intimate and then just pushed it out there. Yeah. And then Will talking to, to um, and uh, Chris, you know, Will talking to Denzel, uh, and then Chris just like. You know, saying what he said, and we still like, was that real or not? So you guys, you couldn't tell either. No, I couldn't tell at all. And we, I'm dissecting the picture. And I'm like, this got to be fake because the form of the photo. And but you heard Will from the from the audience be like, keep my wife's name out of your yeah. fucking mouth. Yep. Oh my god. Yeah, you could hear it, and then we still was like, <laughs> you know, you know, this bit sucks. I was just, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like, I remember hashtagging like, because uh, they were saying Oscar so white, and I'm like, Oscar so who? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was it was very a very interesting night, and then you know we had to go to the gold party after that, and there's protests outside the Oscars. Did you know that? No, no. Why? Man, I don't. People there like Jesus, 
is saying this is abomination. Oh, it's that. I, if I remember going to the something awards, I don't know. I mean, I don't know something. It was Johnson and Johnson. I, so I don't know if that was affiliated. They somehow. could have been right about they, Johnson. Oh, and yeah, Johnson. they well, own the. There's now a protest around any group larger than eighty people. Sure. Like there's an event if it's a college campus. Uh, there, somebody is now going to show up from some group and do something. But these were like the repent now people. Yeah, repent now. Jesus is the way of the Lord. And I remember rolling down my window because this is my first time. So I got to have an experience. And I was like, uh, I just talked to God. He said, y'all on the wrong street. We on, <laughs> we on Vine. He said, go on Coenga. That's where the clubs are on Coenga. Um, so, and then at the after party, there was a protest outside the after party too. Which after party was it? Uh, the gold party, Jay-Z's party. Oh, excuse me. And um, I yeah. was like, uh, you know, um, I don't know what they were protesting about, but I was just ready to eat. You know, <laughs> where was it? Uh, I don't know where it was. Okay, cool. They have the party. I went to the whatever. <laughs> I went to the whatever party. Thought you were going to get me, didn't you? No, I just, there. Like, I know, like, Elton John always does it at the Pacific Design Center. Oh. Or, like, there's a like, hotel. There's or, the Vanity Fair yeah. party, and then there's the one, the Governor's one, or yeah. whatever the oh, one Oh, Governor Ball went to that, too. Yeah, that nice. was uh, there. All right, let me hit. Uh, I speak. date a filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker, so this is not on my strength. Oh, oh, you're the plus one. I'm, pl- I'm holding the purse. I'm taking the photos. Got it. Smart. Yeah, yeah I'm like, good. I'm looking around. I'm, that's, so that's another reason I could be on a smidgen microdose because I don't have to talk to nobody. And right. I don't yeah. have PR like, you got to take this photo or that photo. I can stand there and hold the bag <laughs> and smile. I don't, uh, I, there's a popular misnomer that guys don't like strong women or successful women. Bullshit. I'm all about strong, successful, and cash. That's all I deal with. By, you know, it's not on purpose. I think it's my trauma has led me to, you know, I had a situation with my babysitter when I was 10, and ever since then, I've been attracted to leaders. Oh, shit. What happened with the babysitter? <laughs> this is just turning a negative to a positive. She just threw a pen down. <laughs> Um, we had sex. I got oral sex, and a lot of different things went down. How old were you? Like ten. Wow. How old That's was something she? That's some guys we don't talk about. She had to be like between thirteen and fifteen. And gauging by the, the feel of everything. Is this something Child. you wanted to do? Um, it was. It's. I don't know if I wanted to do, it, but I knew how. Oh. Because I'm from a, a, my family. They get down. You know, my granddad and dad. They 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 like. You know, I don't want to say they womanize, but they have. They great with the women. Mm-hmm. Lotharios. And my yeah. My aunt too. She she like have fun. So yeah, it's just in our genes. Was this uh, But I knew what to do already. You did? Yeah. But like just instinctually? Yeah, like I would read, you know, we go fishing trips and they had a magazine. Got and it. Like my dad would have women, sure, you know, sure. in and out of the place. <laughs> this is we grew great. up quite it's differently. <laughs> my dad His dad didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. My dad got some dope stories. I wish he like I had a photo album of a lot of his conquests that my grandma took the pictures out. <laughs> but he took photos of He them. took photos. Were they dressed? No, they wasn't dressed. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's a whole nother story, mm, yeah. but um I think my dad would have had a leaflet. I don't think it would have been would have been like a do not disturb. <laughs> Size thing, turn it over. That's Nancy. There's Gertrude on the other side. Well, we're done. One time, Pops had a lady over, and then another lady showed up at his house unannounced, knocked on the door. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's you're not supposed to do that, ladies. Mm-hmm. You know that. Right. And so he climbed out the window. He just finished having sex, and he put on a jogging suit, like a velour jogging suit, hot. He jumped out the window and ran full speed around the building and came to the front door and was like, hey, I just, I just been jogging. Uh, that's a genius. Yeah, why don't you come back and... Uh, in like an hour or something, I call you. Just let me shower and get ready and stuff. Wow. Yeah. Refractory wow. period jog. You, your dad shared that story with you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that was like wisdom. Wisdom. Or, the, or sometimes when I would have company or ladies, I'd they share, share these stories. Mm. But he's a still a good dude, though, you know. Sure. Doesn't have to be either or. All right. Let me hit a quick uh, spot here, and then uh, we'll do some news. Good Ranchers <laughs> Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, your waist get bigger, your wallet gets smaller. Good Ranchers wants you to uh, save some money and some spending this year. Beef prices are estimated to increase 20% in 2023. Good Ranchers is letting you lock in the price 
uh, this November when you subscribe during Black Friday savings. With my code ADAM, you get exclusive Black Friday offers. You get two free 12-ounce Black Angus New York Strip steaks. Inflation-proof your meat budget. Get 70 bucks of free. USDA choice steaks and save an additional 25 on every box when you subscribe. That is at Good Ranchers. Get some good protein at Good Ranchers, right, Dawson? Treat yourself or someone you love to Good Ranchers award winning service and quality this holiday season. Remember to visit goodranchers.com slash Adam or use code Adam at checkout to grab their best offer of the year. Black Angus is one of the premier breed. Bre- bre- Black Angus is one of the premier breeds of cattle for high quality beef, so don't have a normal Black Friday this year. Have a Black Angus Friday with two free steaks from Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. All right, we'll take a quick break. Back with Byron. We'll do some news right after this. Well, let's do a quick Leno update. He says uh, he's in good spirits as he recovers from serious burns to his face and chest. His doctor tells reporters that the comedian's injuries are serious, but his condition is good. Uh, Leno suffered significant burns to the face and and hands, as well as his chest while working underneath the car on Saturday. He's undergone one surgery, and uh, that was a grafting procedure. Has another one planned later this week. Uh, His doctor told Fox, currently there's elements of nerve damage. I do anticipate him making a full recovery. Whether uh, there will be remnants of this injury, still too early to tell. And the picture we're looking at is a hyperbaric chamber. That's what I did four sessions, four or five sessions of after my surgery. Um, And you literally just, and it's, from what I understand, it was made for burn victims. It was made for firefighters to go in right after. And Michael Jackson. That's right. Uh, It sucks, at least at first. You definitely feel it. You feel like you're going deep, deep below the sea. The pressure Mm -hmm. feels weird. It, it, It causes, um hypoxia yeah hypoxia yeah but you get used to it and apparently it's supposed to really uh speed up the healing process you know jay byron i met him quite a few times yeah we uh we would uh come he comes down to malibu kitchen on sundays before they shut it down oh you scared to work on cars now uh i've had mishaps and i'm pretty sure um if you do work on your cars you will have a mishap from the drinking uh, uh, antifreeze to like slamming yourself in the door, cutting yourself, all type of different things. <laughs> These kinds of things. How I do you drink of? antifreeze? <laughs> it um, you're doing a, like a hose change under underneath the car, but, but, oh. but splashback. But you you ain't got the equipment to have a pure lift, so you got it on the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of. There's also a lot of like sucking on gas hoses to try to get the transfer pump and the stuff, the siphon, you know. Yeah. Like, that still happens? Uh, yeah. There is old school. Of yeah. Old, yeah. Old, old school done. is yeah. driving your car halfway up onto a curb so you can slide underneath the car. Yep. Got it. And then like not having proper jack stands, so just using like wooden blocks yep. or something, and occasionally shit happens. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. No right. goggles. Oh my God. Yeah, goggles safety now. equipment. Yeah. Or that's gloves, goggles, that kind of that <laughs> oh kind God. of stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, we will stay on top of uh, Jay's recovery. This is a couple days old, but we haven't talked about it. We simply must. Do you know you watch a lot? Well, he watches a lot of TMZ. You're aware of who uh, Pete Davidson's being seen around town with? Yeah. Another. S- b- Hyper car of a woman, yes. very very attractive. Uh, rebounded nicely. <laughs> Emily Ratajkowski. Ratajkowski. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, the two were spotted on a date, according to a celebrity gossip account Dumois. Uh, the eyewitness said that their hands were all over each other, clearly hooking up. Emily, if that name sounds familiar, she had her big breakthrough sort of stardom with Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines video. Uh, then she filed divorce from her husband Sebastian Bear McClard in July after he allegedly cheated and pete's previous girlfriends we the list just gets longer we've got the ariana grandes the kate beckinsales the kim kardashians uh let's not sleep on uh cindy crawford jr Kai either gerber kaya gerber look man he's he, a handsome home guy he found a niche market well now you sound like your dad <laughs> D- i mean he's working this this game you no know it's I mean? it's it i I've, I've said it one thousand times. And the Kaya Gerber thing, I mean, your dad's essentially a Ken doll mm-hmm. and your mom is Cindy Crawford and she right. did not disappoint. Like they're Best she of both just I, so 
everyone kind of focused. She just looks like her mom yeah. when her mom was 19 and a half. That's like, right. All you, I've said it a thousand times. You just got to fuck one hottie and be it, put it yeah. out there. And then that's it. Because chicks, they don't care. Like you couldn't, you couldn't, women could never, could never do that. It mm, would never, that way. that would, that would never, it would never work. You got to knock other it out direction. the park though with that one. Yeah, Once oh, you get yeah. that Ariana Grande, you're fucking set. Yeah. It's, you have a golden ticket for the rest of your life. And, you know, you can argue, oh, he's good looking or he's not good looking or he's funny looking. or he's funny. It's There's tons of better looking dudes, tons of worse looking dudes. You will now, it is now established. Your yeah. you're Dave Chappelle was smoking. Yeah. <laughs> I I'm, I shall now smoke wherever, whenever, yeah. Yeah. all the time. I'm sure he's on a fucking commercial flight right now just with two <laughs> cigarettes lit. And the stewardess is walking right past him, finding some guy who, you know, is vaping in the bathroom and yelling at him. I'm going to tell you this as a spiritual nigga. Once you find your niche, your thing, don't worry about your weakness. You ain't got to be the best looking person. Focus on that. If you can juggle like a motherfucker, juggle. It'll get you, you can have a... Wife from juggling. Wow. Mm. Like, Phil, did Philip the Juggler the get a lot of lot of ass? Hmm? Did Philip the Juggler get a lot of ass? Yeah, Philip the Juggler oh, did well, get a lot you of ass. Then you're right. But he was good looking and oh. he could juggle. Oh, boy. You know what women see when they see a juggler? Somebody who can manage their crazy life. That's a good point. It's a metaphor, man. You see, we don't know because we're not aware. That's why you got to do a hero dose. Open that third eye. <laughs> Mm. Maybe you too could juggle something you didn't know you could juggle. So do it's a like bunch, a commercial do a bunch of mushrooms wow. and see if I can juggle. Not a bunch. You know, all you need is that does. one. Really, it's just like with Pete. You just need that one good trip to open yeah. you up. You don't even have to do it no more after that because you got all the knowledge you need. Where well, do you get your mushrooms? Uh, like he's gonna tell you. Ari Shafir was the first person. <laughs> Saw Ari last night. I know. That's why Just I could tell you that. Yeah, that was oh. the first person who we, who got me, who took us out to a bunch of comedy store guys to the desert in 2014 on uh, an Ari Shroom Fest. That tracks. And then from then you just had to find a good connect. Did anybody See, freak out? Oh yeah, it was one guy. It was one guy, and we seen it coming. Oh boy. He was the only dude getting bit by mosquitoes. It was like, it's like that one person, Drew and then you're like, this is gonna be bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> was let's see where it's funny last conversation i had with ari when he was going here's what i do here's what i do and we're making fun of guys that are in their 40s and 50s with no kids and no wife but you can organize shroom pilgrimage oh. a shroom pilgrimage to the desert with a bunch of comedians awesome. if in fact Nobody with a wife and kids can pull that shit off. No. Can you imagine that you need proclamation? Six notice and then yes. everyone's going to drop out anyway. Right. Well, this is like almost what? T- this was eight years ago. Eight years ago? Like 2014? Am I math? Is my no, math that's right. And you guys went out sort of like they did in that movie, The Doors, <laughs> where they just went out to the desert with Jim Morrison and everyone just tripped. It, we, we tripped. But here's the, here's the crazy part. And this is what Ari was good at. It was a hyper moon. It was shooting stars, and the Milky Way was right in the center of the sky. Mm-hmm. I ain't seen it there since. So it was one of those rare times. It was just the time to do. What, what we desert did. you go to? Joshua Tree, of yeah. course. Oh yeah, you go to Joshua Tree. That was probably mid September, I'm guessing, with the torrid meteor shower and the big moon. Because I've done that a few times. And we was at the Rock and Glass House. We was at a certain house that was made by artists, uh, made out of love. So. Do, my, do mushrooms give you the munchies? What's the eating like mm. with the mushrooms? I couldn't eat on it. Uh, I could definitely anything processed. I had to have like real like grapes and real like fruit and like meat that was just good. a McRib would have been freaky. oh it would have been bad yeah. yeah so and I remember eating an orange and I was like man I'm eating this orange like I'm the first guy to ever taste an orange right for the first time in history that's what that's what it is because you're so present to what you're feeling. And what you're what you're eating at the time, and the way it nourishes and hits your body, you like, man, the universe created it. How the fuck the universe get this formula right to create this? You just like in tune with this with this thing. I think the world would be a better place if people did some shrooms once in a while. Once yeah. in a while. But I don't have faith, Adam, that you would do shrooms and have that experience. You'd be like, you know what the problem with oranges is? 
I can go there. I mean, I would tend to break things in societal things apart. You know, well, you do that, yeah. The first time I got high on mushrooms, I saw the Lee Press on fingernail <laughs> commercial, which was it, oh. it was a thing it, Stuck we've them. talked about, but it's like women simulating bloody claws. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, and why that's a societal thing, and then why that's attractive, and then the next commercial that came on the TV was a monster truck jam and it was like giant monster trucks smashing smaller trucks and the crowd was like cheering yeah. and I was like it's barbaric yeah, you can't we be love trucks <laughs> we yeah. love the idea of big trucks smashing yeah. little trucks that was the thing that's why I said you have to be in nature you can yeah. not be it's better. with TV because everything is uh, against that everything yeah. man has created is against nature Yes, and you will feel and see that now you see in patterns right if you're a car guy, you could look at something and tell how it works. Right. Or you, like when you walk in a building, I'm like, oh, this is how the beams are. These are the tiles and all that. So it will help you pick apart society, the world, and mankind on different wavelengths. Mm. And you can see why we go to war and why the stock market do what it does and how we became the for better for worse who we who we are. Damn. Yeah. It's true. Anybody else out in the uh, desert with you and Ari? Uh, it was like 14 of us. Wow. Was it all so dudes? It, it was all dudes. And everybody's walking and doing their own thing. And I remember Ari asking me, uh, um, do you need anything? And I was like, I am everything. <laughs> I don't need nothing. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, I know what it's like to eat, so I'm not hungry. I cannot urinate right now, you know? <laughs> I couldn't step on grass or anything like that because I felt like the God part of me created that grass. Wow. And if I stepped on it, I was killing Killing mm. the grass. You would definitely have like an ayahuasca vibe. Like yeah, I had a spiritual, like wow. seeing the, the sacred geometric patterns and stuff oh, like boy. that. Feeling like I landed, crash landed on earth and the mechanics of my body being like a suit um, and feeling like a spirit in a body and getting used to the air, feeling like air going my lungs and like processing that and coming out and saying, once we colonize this place, we're going to, I think I found a place where we could like. Live. I had that whole experience. <laughs> wow. Okay. I felt high just listening to that. Yeah. New idea. Ari Shafir takes us out, and we do that, but it's a live remote, and we'll have our mics on. I would I would go I for Probably that. not the same Ari, though. Really? No. <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, it's probably not the same Ari from eight years ago. Oh, okay. That's okay. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we, we'll we dance with him. the Ari I saw him have. last night. That version will do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Gina, let's bring it home. I got a hard out. You got it. I'm Gina Grad. That's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, Byron Bowers, you got to come back because I, I feel Ugh. feel high. Thank you. Uh, I'm doing my job. Byron Bowers, <laughs> spiritual N-word, streaming now on uh, Hulu and live dates. You can go to byronbowerslive.com for all the live dates. David Fenton, the activist media handbook is available where we uh, where you buy finer books. I'm going to be at the Rialto Theater December 15th in Tucson and then off four shows in Tempe at the Tempe Improv. Just go to AdamCarolla.com for all my live shows. And until next time, this is Adam Carolla. For David Fenton, Byron Bowers, and Gina Grad, say it. Mahalo. Mahalo.